has not ratified the treaty for the uh, elimination of discrimination against women. Uh, my mother was born in Korea, is now an American citizen. If she were still living in Korea, she would be protected by the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Here she is not. My daughter, her mother is an Irish American. If she were in Ireland, she would be protected by the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. In the United States, she is not. This is awful. This is unjustifiable. Or take the fact that we are one of only two countries in the world that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The other is Somalia. Their explanation is they have no organized government. <laughs> we have no similar excuse. And then new treaties. Uh, we've refused to join the Convention on Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. Why? Because increasingly we're being accused of committing forced disappearances. And as Eric Rosenthal and MDRI can tell us, we have refused to participate meaningfully in the Convention on Persons with Disabilities, even though the United States has expertise, has contributed to the content and implementation, and has some of the best disability practices at home. <laughs> in other words, we fail to support the creation of universal standards and fail to exercise human rights leadership. Take accountability. The uh, Bush administration started the uh, term by unsigning and withdrawing from the International Criminal Court. This is of special concern here at the Dodd Center because in 1995, President Clinton came to the opening of the Dodd Center to call for an International Criminal Court. Subsequently, the U.S. failed to sign the treaty in 1998 but through the work of a number of us in the administration, at the end of the Clinton administration in 2000, the president signed the International Criminal Court Treaty. When we did, uh, we all said nobody would ever withdraw from this treaty. In fact, that's exactly what happened. And the Bush administration began to wage war on the International Criminal Court. What is the irony? The irony is that for all of the rhetoric, the hostile rhetoric, the accountability practices have been to passively support the court. There was a referral to the International Criminal Court on Darfur. We passively supported prosecutions in Congo and Uganda. The president called for the Sierra Leone Tribunal to try Charles Taylor of Liberia. The U.S. has uh, prosecuted Charles Taylor's son. Uh, there has been some progress with the Cambodian Tribunal. There's been support for the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic and Saddam Hussein, although we all now realize that the execution of Saddam Hussein had the extraordinary effect of making one of the world's greatest human rights violators seem like a sympathetic figure, and therefore the execution itself to be rushed and vindictive. How about ongoing abuses uh, of conflagration continues in Darfur? We've been stunningly ineffective uh, in curbing abuses in North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And the United States has undermined human rights mechanisms, uh, <coughs> has boycotted the new Human Rights Council, sent to the UN an incredibly unsuccessful ambassador, John Bolton. No new ambassador has been appointed. We created a tense relationship with the outgoing uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan and an as yet undefined relationship with the new Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of Korea. And future abuses, preventive measures have also dropped. Uh, the United States has diminished its emphasis on democracy building around the world and public-private partnerships, which had gotten a promising start after the Berlin Wall fell, uh, have declined with a few modest successes. If you've seen the movie Blood Diamond, you saw uh, the creation of the Kimberley process, some efforts with extractives, uh, extractive industries to create uh, government, corporate, uh, uh, memorandum of, of Understanding, the so-called Global Compact. In China, Google is now participating uh, in uh, blocking websites and availability for Chinese human rights activists. And these tragically have blunted our ability to criticize others. Take a look at this. Our report on Iran criticizes security forces who monitor telephone calls, open mail without court authorization, engage in illegal detentions, abuse and torture prisons, and official, unofficial secret prisons. You know, this is uh, the pot calling the kettle black. And China and Russia, our two leading uh, superpower uh, rivals, uh, have not lost notice of this. 
uh, Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao. We urge the U.S. government to acknowledge its own problems. Don't interfere in our problems. President Putin uh, himself, no Democrat, declared the day after September 11th, we have a common enemy, terrorism. And that gives me freedom to persecute the Chechens. Immediately the U.S. had put Chechen groups on its list of terrorist organizations. Uh, we have played completely into their hands. So this is a very discouraging picture. And the challenge is, going forward, how do we make sure that our policy is not simply, our human rights policy should not simply be a terrorism policy. Our human rights policy is so much broader than a terrorism policy. At the dawn of the 21st century, we had a policy that balanced diplomacy and force, power and principle, international and national and public and private institutions, and the past, present, and future. And this has been disrupted by a shift, as I said, to force back by diplomacy, <coughs> using hard power, military power at the expense of our human rights principle, and failing to support our basic principles. What about putting our own houses in order? We should close Guantanamo. There is no reason to have it open. We should either charge the detainees, hold them in some other way, or find someone else who should take them. And we should never use Guantanamo again. The real question should be directed to former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Why on earth did you open Guantanamo as a detention facility in the first place? You had no exit strategy. Now your exit strategy is to wait for the Supreme Court to call it illegal, and then you'll close it having accomplished nothing, having tried nobody, having convicted nobody, and having created a human rights black eye for the United <coughs> States to no positive end. We should revise the Military Commissions Act, restoring the writ of habeas corpus. This might be done if the Supreme Court simply strikes down the Military Commissions Act, which I argue they will. We should admit the Committee of the Red Cross into our detention facilities. We should ban the use of torture and cruel treatment by U.S. personnel and contractors. And if you've been following the Blackwater scandal, it shows you the problem with our using private military abroad. We should stop the practice of extraordinary renditions. We are not living in a world in which Jack Bauer is the President of the United States. I'm sorry. <laughs> with the Human Rights Council, we should begin discussions with it by sending a special envoy. We should shift to a policy of constructive engagement in and the next five years, I think, will be a tale of three globalizations. The globalization of governance, the globalization of freedom, and the globalization of terror. The question is, how do we use the first two to solve the third? How do you use the globalization of governance and freedom to combat the globalization of terror? This means using global cooperation among global democracies to solve global problems. And finally, how to bring the United States back into compliance with the rule of law. It means looking to our executive branch. Will they follow international law? Our legislative branch, will they live up to our human rights commitments? Our judicial branch, will they pay, as the Declaration of Independence says, decent respect to the opinions of mankind? And will civil society <coughs> monitor and hold our leaders accountable? They did it in Vietnam, they did it in uh, Watergate. Will they do it here? Let me conclude by saying a very simple point. Ours is a country that was founded on human rights. Our Declaration of Independence defines us in human rights terms. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we violate these human rights, we no longer know who we are. <coughs> and it defines who we are both as a nation and a people. And let me make a simple point. Human rights reputation is too important to leave to politicians. It is a duty of all of us, all of us here. It is civil society, not governments, that have defended human rights and humanitarian law through the ages. Protecting and repairing and developing our human rights system is a core challenge for all thinking 21st century citizens, lawyers, educators, law students, college students, everyone here in this room. It is the core activity of the Dodd Center, and it has to be our core activity in the years ahead. That is the end of the lecture. Let me say thank you all very much.